On the broadcast tonight, Koreans age 65 and above with an income in the bottom 70% bracket start receiving up to 186 US dollars per month from next July. That's part of the government's basic pension program set to be announced Thursday, but it's bound for some heated debate. We'll tell you why. A hoped for thawing relations between the U.S. and Iran is not taking hold as quickly as some had hoped. Both U.S. President Barack Obama and Iranian President Hassan Rouhani spoke at the United Nations, but instead of grand gestures, the world saw optimistic yet cautious rhetoric. And the death toll from a powerful earthquake in southwestern Pakistan rises to more than 200 people as hundreds of soldiers are dispatched to the region to help in the rescue efforts. We'll have the latest. Early edition begins now. It is 2 a.m. in Los Angeles, 12.30 in the afternoon in Tehran and 6 on a Wednesday evening here in Seoul. Welcome to Early Edition at 6. I'm Moon Gon Young. And I'm Daniel Chan. Thank you for tuning in. We begin with the government efforts to provide better welfare. That's right. Actually, the central government has drawn up a plan to help the nation's local governments generate more revenue and finance increased welfare services. The local authorities can now levy higher consumption taxes in their districts, but as our Yurian reports, it's just not enough to satisfy the regional governments. Economic policymakers on Tuesday released a set of measures to support local governments, which have been under a mounting financial burden. The problems that the local governments have worsened since the central government expanded the country's free child care system and lowered an acquisition tax to revitalize the housing market earlier this year. Now the central government says it will increase state subsidies for free daycare services by 10 percentage points from its current ratio. That means the central government will soon be covering 30 percent of the total cost in Seoul and 60 percent for other regions. We are making up for a shortfall in the local government's revenues caused by last month's comprehensive real estate measures. We will also ease their financial burden heightened by the free child care services. To make up for the shortfall in tax revenue caused by a cut in the home acquisition tax, the local government will be allowed to increase their consumption tax. The consumption tax will gradually increase from the current 5 percent to 11 percent by 2015 which will create new revenues of about 2.6 trillion won, or roughly 2.2 billion U.S. dollars. These measures are being met with great resistance from local governments, however, as they fall short of their original demands. The city of Seoul in particular said in a statement following the announcement that even with the new measures in place, it will need about 300 million U.S. dollars to fund an expanded child care program next year. Yurian, Arirang News. The Korean government is seeking to turn nine low-end areas near the country's major cities into high-tech industrial complexes by the year 2015 to attract more investment. The plan is to designate three areas next year as new locations for industrial complexes and six more in 2015. The government presented the plan during its third trade and investment meeting presided over by President Park geun -hye. Currently, there are 11 such complexes nationwide designated back in 2001 to foster the culture and communications industries. But the complexes have not been attracting as much investment as initially projected because of high land prices and remote locales. President Park said the competitiveness of such industrial areas is directly linked to the nation's ex export competitiveness and urged the government to create complexes that are more innovative. The Korean government has finalized a basic pension bill which will be submitted at a cabinet meeting presided over by President Park Geun-hye tomorrow, that is Thursday, here in Korea. As many had expected, it's a scaled-down version of the one she introduced when she was a candidate, and it's all about certain to raise the ire of her critics. Our Ajinju has the story. 
Starting next July, senior citizens aged 65 and older that fall in the lower 70% income bracket will receive up to 200,001 or about $186 in basic pension payouts per month. People in the upper 30% income bracket of this age group will receive none. This is part of the government's basic pension bill finalized on Wednesday and scheduled to be submitted at a cabinet meeting presided over by the president on Thursday. However, even for those in the bottom 70 percent, the amount of pension payout will vary in accordance with how long they have paid into the national pension system. Some may receive as little as $93, while those who have contributed to the system for 11 years or less can receive the maximum $186. In order to fall in the lower 70% income bracket, a senior citizen must earn less than $770 per month. The government explains that more than 90% of the people in the bottom 70% will receive the maximum amount of $186. But the plan is likely to be the target of public and political criticism since it falls short of an earlier pledge to extend $186 in basic pension payments to all citizens aged 65 and older, not just to some. President Pag is expected to address the controversial welfare pledges, including the basic pension issue, during Thursday's cabinet meeting and explain to the public how it was nearly impossible to secure the funds needed to fulfill the goal. Experts predict that she will, however, vow to do her best to achieve her welfare promises by the time her term in office is over. Oh Jin Ju, Arirang News. Hyundai Motor and its affiliate Kia Motors are recalling about 660,000 vehicles in South Korea, the largest in the nation's history over a faulty brake switch. The recall affects 15 different Hyundai and Kia models produced between 2007 and 2011. Hyundai said in a statement that similar recalls in other countries are likely to follow. Hyundai and Kia recalled more than 1.8 million vehicles in the United States in April over the same faulty brake issue. Amid a flurry of signs that North Korea may actively be developing its nuclear technology, an emerging question is, what's next? With some even predicting a possible fourth nuclear test, experts attending the ASEAN North Korea Conference 2013 in Seoul on this Wednesday exchanged ideas on what to expect. Adirang News Unification Ministry correspondent Hwang sang was there and she filed us this report. Before going ahead with its fourth nuclear test, North Korea will try to showcase its improved nuclear capability, providing an opportunity for fresh negotiations. That's according to American arms control expert Joshua Pollack, who was speaking at the ASEAN North Korea conference in Seoul on Wednesday. The next step, in my educated guess, would be to show us what analysts sometimes call the ground truth, uh, to, to bring a trusted set of eyes inside the facilities uh, so they can use them to, to bargain with us uh, and to put pressure on us to come to the table more on their terms. In April, the North announced the reboot of its facilities at Yangbyon, and recent satellite imagery of the complex suggests steady progress has already been made. Pyongyang is believed to have doubled the floor size of its uranium enrichment plant and reactivated its plutonium production reactor. Dr. Marcus Schiller from Schmucker Technology says such developments are not an imminent threat, but rather a bargaining chip for the North. There are so many things that can go wrong if you put this rocket on a launch site and prepare that for a launch as a nuclear attack against the United States that I wouldn't bet anything on doing this. So if you ask me if it's technical cap technically capable, yes it is, but it's highly, highly unlikely that they will ever do that. But considering North Korea's unpredictability, experts say the concerned parties should maintain their close cooperation on the situation. Before the first North Korean nuclear test, the North Korean government inf informed China it was going to do a nuclear test. So uh, I would say that uh, there should be a lot of discussions uh, among you know, China, United States, and South Korea on how to assess uh, North Korea's uh, nuclear weapon capability. 
In any case, experts say dialogue may be the best way to go in tackling the current challenges with North Korea. Hwang sang Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye has appointed the head of the Korean Navy as the new chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The Defense Ministry announced Wednesday that Chief of Naval Operations Choi Yun-hee was selected to replace General Jung Seung-jo, whose two-year term ends next month. Admiral Choi Yun-hee, a 59-year-old veteran Marine well known for his strategic leadership, was nominated to succeed succeed General Chung. The current deputy commander of the Combined Forces Command, General Kwon Oh Sung, has been tapped as the next chief of the Army, while the superintendent of the Naval Academy, Vice Admiral Hwang ki was nominated to be the new chief of naval operations. Now, this will be the first time a naval officer has headed the Joint Chiefs, and according to Seoul's Defense Ministry, the change aims to strengthen cooperation between the Army, the Navy, Air Force, and other military services. The new candidates must gain parliamentary approval before being officially appointed by President Park Geun-hye. The National Assembly is expected to vote on the nominations tomorrow, that is Thursday, here in Korea. U.S. President Barack Obama has appealed to the United Nations to put pressure on the Syrian regime to give up its chemical weapons. In a hectic day of diplomacy, President Obama also offered an olive branch to Iran over its controversial nuclear program. Our Kim Hyun-bin reports. President Obama called on the UN General Assembly to make sure there will be serious consequences if Syria refuses to hand over its chemical weapons. With the Syrian government seemingly hesitant to live up to his side of the Russian broker plan, Obama called for a strong UN resolution that will punish Syria if it fails to surrender its stockpile in a verifiable way. The Syrian government took a first step by giving an accounting of its stockpiles. Now there must be a strong Security Council resolution to verify that the Assad regime is keeping its commitments. And there must be consequences if they fail to do so. The U.S. leader also laid out Washington's priorities for Syria, as well as the rest of the Middle East and North Africa. Obama said the U.S. always considers diplomatic solutions, but does not rule out the use of military force against extremist threats. On Iran, Obama says a deal that would allow Tehran to have its own nuclear program should be possible if it acts in a, quote, transparent and verifiable way. Obama said he had instructed his secretary of state to hold face-to-face -face negotiation with his Iranian counterpart regarding Tehran's nuclear program. I want to be clear. We are encouraged that President Rouhani received from the Iranian people a mandate to pursue a more moderate course. And given President Rouhani's stated commitment to reach an agreement, I am directing John Kerry to pursue this effort with the Iranian government. President Hassan Rouhani's recent overtures to hold talks have raised hopes that U.S.-Iran relations could improve after more than three decades of estrangement. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. And right there at the U.N. General Assembly, amid high hopes that a fast-moving diplomatic track might be opening with Iran, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani said Tehran is seeking constructive engagement with the West on its nuclear program and does not want to increase tensions with the United States. Speaking just a few hours after U.S. President Barack Obama, Rouhani said he was willing to engage in time-bound and result-based nuclear talks and reiterated that nuclear weapons are not part of Iran's security policy. Nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction have no place in Iran's security and defense doctrine and contradict our fundamental religious and ethical convictions. Yet the new Iranian leader did not make gestures to Western sensibilities that many diplomats had expected in such a high-profile setting. President Rouhani condemned the United States for imposing punishing economic sanctions on Iran for using a missile-firing drone aircraft against, quote, innocent people and for threatening military action against Iran. Now, the foreign ministers of Korea and Japan plan to meet uh, this week in New York on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly, where Seoul is expected to call on Tokyo to face up to history if it wants to better its bilateral relations with Korea. 
This comes against the backdrop of souring relations between the two countries over historical, territorial and more recently trade disputes. Joining us live in the studio to give us some perspective is Dr. Lee Myung-woo, Vice President of Seoul-based Sejong Institute. Dr. Lee, thank you for coming back thank to the you. program. Good to be here. Uh, so, Dr. Yi, let's begin with this question. While mm. Japanese leaders have repeatedly said that they want to increase their influence in, yes. the re in this region, mm. Tokyo doesn't seem to have any plans, in fact, to apologize, to acknowledge, mm. and take responsibility for the atrocities that it committed during World War II mm. and during its colonial period mm. uh, here in the Korean Peninsula. Why is Tokyo so unwilling to compromise when it wants to play such a leadership role in this region? Probably the main reason would be uh, the pride they have in their past history. Probably that would be the uh, one of the big reason they could not uh, apologize for what they did uh, to others. But uh, uh, for recent, uh, let's say, uh, uh, events, I think uh, we can think of uh, three uh, reasons. Even though we uh, uh, we may not agree on that and we we may not like it. But the uh, first thing is that uh, they are arguing that uh, there is no evidence that uh, for the use of any uh, force to recruit that uh, comfort, so-called comfort uh, women. And another thing is that uh, I think uh, the comfort house at that time, run by the, even, even though run by the uh, military, is kind of a commonplace. So it is not something we can uh, talk about now. I mean, I think that's the, uh, one of the reasons that they are arguing that there is no evidence for the use of any uh, force, that kind of things, I think. And the third thing is that uh, Japan's argue that it's already, money-wise, it's already a settled thing. So uh, in the uh, former uh, agreement between uh, Japan and Korea, so there is nothing that they can do, so there is no apology or uh, any other uh, compensation for that. Well, I, I think uh, you're talking about the 1965 mm. treaty in San Francisco yes. between Korea and Japan, mm. which uh, we have experts here have said mm -hmm. that have confirmed that mm. uh, the quote comfort women issue was mm. not negotiated in that deal. Yes. So uh, it, you know we can argue otherwise against Japan, right? Mm. But uh, it's kind of controversial when Japan is arguing that. Uh, in that uh, clause, I mean, the, one of the clause in that uh, treaty says that it includes everything. Even though we did, could not acknowledge at that time, I mean, the Korean side acknowledged that the issue of the comfort uh, uh, women issue, but uh, even though we did not recognize what that, uh, the existence of that kind of issue, but uh, the clause, the Japan argues that uh, it includes everything is settled. Of whatever uh, happened right, that's, then. Uh, mm -hmm. that's the so story that, that's there. The kind of thing. And we are still arguing, as you mm -hmm. said, that right. uh, we are arguing that is something we did not catch that time. So, uh, and we are also, the uh, present uh, government's position is that uh, it's a kind of human right kind of issue. So mm. it's uh, beyond that kind of agreement right, or treaty. Right. Yeah. right, so Japan sticking by the fact that it was a different time, it's all settled, yes. it's all in the past. Korea mm -hmm. is of course mm -hmm. focused on the mm -hmm. humanitarian aspect of mm -hmm. it, it's a humanitarian issue that we need yes. to address now. Mm -hmm. uh, more recently, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said he, uh, mm -hmm. he will be addressing the United Nations General Assembly uh, this week on the sexual slavery issue. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think his motives are and uh, what mm -hmm. does Tokyo seek to achieve from this uh, diplomatic move? Mm -hmm. I think it's mainly uh, related with the uh, uh, recent, let's say, criticism against or uh, towards that Japan or Japanese government under his kind of leadership. They say one uh, interesting episode, uh, recent episode, is that uh, about two weeks ago, a uh, Japanese rightist, ultra rightist cities group uh, kind of announced that uh, they will uh, sue that uh, Kono, a former. Uh, so-called uh, Secretary General, who made that Kono uh, you know, statement. The reason is that it's because of uh, Kono that uh, everybody is uh, arguing that or criticize Japan for wrongdoings about that uh, comfort women issue. I think that in return shows that uh, how much there are uh, criticism 
in and outside the, uh, Japan, I think. So that then maybe it is so uh, Abe's, uh, Mr. Abe's uh, trial at that uh, UN would be that to kind of review or to, to make uh, some uh, good image of uh, Japan to others, I think. Right. Um, another issue that's stirring up controversy is Japan's plan to have a number of historical and industrial facilities registered in the uh, on the UNESCO's World Heritage Site list. Now, um, of course, it's stirring up controversy here in Korea because hundreds, if not thousands, of Koreans were forced into labor uh, at some of those facilities, including the Yawata Steel Works in Fukuoka and a shipyard near Nagasaki, where during the colonial period, of course, where many lost their lives as well. Now, will the international community recognize uh, this controversial site as world heritage, and how should Seoul go about handling this? Mm, I don't think. Well, uh, I hope, <laughs> I mean, I hope not uh, they, they will kind of acknowledge that as a uh, world kind of a heritage or that kind of things. As you may say, that uh, there's a forced labor and it is it's related uh, at the present time. Uh, it's related to human kind of uh, human rights issue and that kind of thing. So, but uh, I think this one is a little different from the comfort human issue. I mean, we are more, or the world is more kind of concerned with that, uh, this uh, uh, women's issue or women, uh, human rights issue, and they, they are more sensitive to that. But uh, this uh, forced labor issue is, a little, I think, a little different in many kind of, uh, let's say, uh, aspects. So there may be some uh, other, let's say, uh, elements to say this one, you know, to see it. But I hope that, as I just mentioned, I hope that uh, they do right and kind of a rational kind of a judgment on that. Okay. Well, interestingly, right after uh, uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's address at the UN, uh, UN of course, we have mm -hmm. our Foreign Minister Yun Myung Se yes. going right up there, uh, next mm -hmm. in line, uh, to discuss the sexual slavery issue. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, Seoul can convince Tokyo to change its course of action or attitude and by making it a global human rights issue? Mm -hmm. I think for President uh, Mr. Abe's cabinet, I think it is pretty hard to change or change their mind or convince them to change their positions on those issues. As just mentioned, they are by themselves, I mean, in themselves very proud of their, let's say, uh, past history, even though there are some, you know, they say uh, they have some reflections with that kind of thing. So I think it is very hard for us or well, I mean that uh, the uh, well, Korean government to convince them to change, you know. But I think we have to do uh, because the, the relation between uh, Korea and Japan is very important, not only for Japan but uh, for Korea too. So I think uh, we need to uh, try to convince them. Right, like you said, uh, the relations between Korea and Japan are important in other very many aspects as well. Uh, what do you think are President Park Geun-hye's objectives in, in developing relations uh, with Japan? I mean, how do you see the two countries shaping up, uh, ties shaping up by the end of President Park's term in 2018? Mm, as just mentioned, I mean, <clears throat> I think two parties, I mean, this, I mean, Japan and Korea, know it's there are good bilateral relations between uh, uh, Japan and Korea is very necessary and very good for uh, both countries. But uh, as you also know that uh, President Park and in a sense uh, Prime Minister Abe is quite a firm believer for what they believe or, or, or what their own history in a sense. So I think it's pretty uh, difficult to come to that kind of some in the middle way to get some kind of agreements and to, to, to go further, I think. So, and as you may know well, that, uh, President Park is pretty strong for what he, uh, what she, uh, what her believes, uh, what she believes, I mean, and uh, to maintaining her position. So in that sense, it is quite hard to see some middle point uh, between these uh, two uh, leaders, I think. So one way is that we may maintain this state quo kind of a, or to, to dissect it, uh, kind of relations between uh, two countries, I think.
Okay, hopefully we are going to be able to meet halfway and mm -hmm. see eye to eye on a number of other subjects yes. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. Himianu, thank you so much for joining us today. We thank look you. forward to turning to you again when we have uh, similar instances when we turn to when we need to turn to an expert about Korea-Japan related issues. Thank you. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life. Talking with you on air and online. Connecting you with heroes and experts to help you understand the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best, with Moon Gun Young and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6. At least 250 people were killed after a major earthquake hit a remote part of southwestern Pakistan Tuesday, and tremors were reportedly felt as far away as in the Indian capital of New Delhi. The 7.7 .7 magnitude quake struck near Kuzdar in Balishistan province around 4.30 p.m. local time. The province is the nation's largest but the least populated. The deputy speaker of the Balishistan Assembly told Reuters that at least 30 percent of the houses in the district have collapsed. More than 200 soldiers have been dispatched to the area for rescue operations. Meanwhile, a Korean citizen was murdered in the Philippines this week, the ninth such case in the Southeast Asian country this year. The Korean embassy in Manila said the body of the 40-year-old victim identified only by her surname Chung was found on Monday in an office uh, building that she used to work. Chung was operating at a traveling agency in Manila. The Korean embassy is planning to officially ask authorities in the Philippines next week for thorough investigations into the recent homicides of Korean victims. And that's all from us for this hour. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you right back here same time tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and we'll see you right back here same time tomorrow. Good night.